Another short video to answer the question, who were the first children of mankind after creation? And also, after the flood, very important. There seems tons of confusion from some, especially on the Genesis accounts of these, uh, and that's because Genesis does not stand alone as a witness of creation and the flood. There's the problem. It needs its one or two witnesses. That's what Scripture says is required, uh, especially the main one for this topic, the book of Jubilees. Moses did not write only five books of Torah, and no Scripture ever says so, by the way. Uh, that's Phariseeism and a claim in Phariseeism, which is known today as Rabbinic Judaism. He wrote six books. And the book of Jubilees has been censored by the Pharisees even from the time of Messiah, in his own words. That's their illiterate paradigm. And we're still stuck with it today. But see, Pharisees don't get to usurp the priesthood. No, no, no. Not legitimately. And we aren't to follow them. Uh, they stole the temple even. They had no right to do that. They were foreigners who came in and attacked the land in 165 BC. That's the actual story, and that's a story that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. If scholars could only read, they can't very clearly. They'll tell you, oh, Essenes lived in Qumran. That is utterly stupid. There's no other way to call that. That is, their, they're coming right out to your face, and they are lying to you. Most of them know better. Some don't because they listen to other liars and then just repeat the paradigm. They hijacked the Bible canon from that time. Uh, now, of course, Yahuwah has preserved his word. He said he would preserve his word. But where does he preserve his word? He does so in heaven on the heavenly tablets. Now, that's clear in Jubilees and First Enoch. And something that the church has lost and doesn't understand. So Bible scholars go out there and say, oh, well, you know, that particular book had to be preserved in the Hebrew, every word of it. If it wasn't, then it can't possibly be Bible canon. Well, how much of Scripture is preserved, every word of it, in the ancient Hebrew? Very little. Understand that. I mean, there were whole texts found in Qumran, but not that many. Most of the, the Old Testament, uh, all was found there except for the book of Esther, which vets is uh, uh, an occult, you know, uh, manufactured book, certainly not scripture. Uh, but Bible canon is kept by those ordained by Moses. Would, would he not have thought of that? Well, of course he did. Scripture's clear. The Levite priests, of which Pharisees are not Levites, never were. Their claims have always been false. Yahushua affirmed this many times. And yet, on this channel, almost every day, we'll hear someone try to defend their Pharisee Bible, not even knowing what they're doing. Basically, Yahushua said that they turned Torah against Torah in Mark 7. He told them they err, not knowing the scriptures, and even called them out for ignoring portions of Torah, which most certainly is Jubilees, because the Pharisees, even today, will tout Torah, 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 and they'll talk about the five books. They never talk about Jubilees, do they? Hmm. Why? Because they're illiterate. They don't know what Torah even is. They lost it 2,000 years ago, and they don't have it now. And then they take it and reinterpret it through the Talmud in the most disgusting lies imaginable, says Yahusha, if we listen to him, that is. The temple priest put this in writing, telling us Jubilees is Torah and written by Moses to be used as the exact determination for keeping especially the times of Torah. That's called Torah, folks. And Moses wrote it, thus it is Torah. Duh. Uh, what scholar can't seem to get that? Well, they don't bother to read or they don't want to. We published both of these books, uh, uh, Jubilees and First Enoch, with a comprehensive uh, Torah test, and they pass. Uh, go ahead, test it yourself. Follow it through and see what we do or do not prove. You don't know if you haven't reviewed it. Pharisees do not. 
uh, they don't prove anything. They just say. In fact, that's, that is the rabbi way, to just say whatever is on your mind. It is the dumbest paradigm we've ever seen. And when you read even the ancient writings of Pharisees, they are the most ridiculous babblings we've ever seen. Now, when we consider these other sources, Genesis becomes very clear, and especially on this topic. Watch for yourself, test, and learn. Let's start with before the flood, after creation with Genesis. We've covered this before, but we're going to put this in one video uh, and especially get to the first birth after creation, which is cool. Now then, we'll see who was born first after the flood. Now, who were the first children? Well, Genesis 3.23 uh, says, Therefore, Yahuwah Elohim sent him, Adam, forth out or from the Garden of Eden. All right, so he's exiled then. Were there any children prior? There's not a single reference to a child prior. Doesn't happen. What's he do? To till the ground from whence he was taken. In other words, that's where he was created. Jubilees clarifies that. We cover that in detail. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim. Now, cherubim is plural already. It doesn't need the S there. But the fact that it's plural and then it has an S, you know, for the English. Uh, hello, it's more than one. <laughs> it's at least two. So there you go. And why only on the east side? We've said this many times. Because the Garden of Eden is enclosed within the earth and it only has one entrance. Now, Enoch is very, very clear on that. He describes it from within the earth and then he describes it from above uh, it's all there. It's so super clear. And a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So to protect the tree of life. Why? Because the tree of life, well, it's still there. And it comes up in Revelation at least, I think, three times, uh, which we've covered in great detail that we will, again, have access to, the garden will be opened, and we'll have access to the tree of life. There you go. And it will be healing ointment to, you know, to our bodies. Uh, it will be the tool for eternal life. Now, where does the Bible say they had children already here? Well, nowhere. Uh, it actually says they did not yet. Uh, there was no sex in the Garden of Eden, first of all. And bear in mind, if you go to Sinai, the garden is incorruptible because that is the holy of holies of Yahuwah on earth. Understand that. Now, we see a parallel there that we can understand why that's the case on Mount Sinai. So the men, when his presence was about to come down on Mount Sinai, Moses was instructed to tell the men not to have relations with their wives for three days leading up to Yahuwah's presence. Now, that doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean it's evil. It's just something you don't do in his physical presence. Period. Done. The end. Now, that presence resides in the Garden of Eden. That's his permanent Holy of Holies on earth since creation. Yes, there was one in Israel where his presence was in the Ark of the Covenant, inside of the Holy of Holies, in the inner court of the temple, yes, that was there uh, for a few centuries, and that's it. But, so no children as of the time of the garden exile. None. Especially not Cain yet. He's not born. No, no, let, 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 let's, let's see. Let's see who's first. There's no room here for Adam to have a wife before Eve. That's ridiculous. That's not scripture. Never has been. We're going to get to that in great detail soon in our creation series. There's no room here for uh, Eve to have uh, had uh, relations with uh, the serpent or Satan. It was Satan, but even if it was this uh, alien creature serpent that another channel stupidly uh, propagates and the dumbest thing we've ever, ever seen. I mean, I, it's so ridiculous. But anyway, uh, it, it, no, because Cain wasn't born for uh, over 50 years. So they're saying that Eve was pregnant for 50 plus years. Now that's pretty dumb. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. Okay, so now they had relations after the garden. They, they were just exiled. We read that, right? We just saw that. That's in the previous chapter. Now here's the next chapter, which is really continuation. But regardless, chronologically, this happens 
after. So they did not do that in the garden. A Jubilees does say they did uh, when Eve was created, uh, but then they went into the garden and no more. And there's no record of anything. So, and she conceived. Wait a minute. She wasn't already pregnant. Well, wait a minute. How is it that she wasn't already pregnant if the serpent seed doctrine was accurate? And somehow, you know, she had relations with Satan in the garden and he's uh, father or part father of Cain. That's ridiculous. It's never been scripture. This is so clear even in Genesis. But Jubilees crushes it. Uh, and it's inconceivable when you put the two together. Absolutely. So, uh, watch, is Cain the serpent seed? And we obliterate that nonsense. And bear Cain. So now she has Cain. And said, and again, after the garden. So no children in the garden. And said, I have gotten a man from Yahuwah. Notice Eve did not thank Satan uh, for fathering Cain because he didn't. She didn't thank some alien serpent either because, well, there is no such thing. It's stupidity. Uh, it was Satan very Clearly, the shining one, the Nakash, well known throughout scripture, even his Latin name Lucifer, the light bearer. So, all the same. And she again bare his brother Abel. No, not twins, as some propagate, especially rabbis and some pastors pick up on it, because they don't bother to test and they don't bother to read. They don't know what they're talking about. Uh, it certainly does not say so here, right, again, but Genesis is not meant to stand alone. Moses wrote it with Jubilees, and Jubilees has detail that you don't find in Genesis for that reason. Now, no wonder we are missing so much detail, uh, which then gets exploited by the rabbis, Pharisees, uh, and Pharisee scholars who follow them rather than the Bible, which is really dumb, uh, and can't even seem to read for themselves because they're so steeped in a paradigm. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Was there anything wrong with Cain's being a tiller of the ground, by the way? Well, no, so was Adam. So there's nothing wrong with that. It was his heart in uh, the sacrifice. Uh, that was his problem. And that was his problem for the rest of his life. Cain was evil as a result. He became evil. He wasn't born evil. That's ridiculous. Uh, some have tried that. And some, of course, try to say he was the spawn of Satan because he was bad. No, he was bad because he was bad. He chose to be. So here we go to Jubilees, which really nails this down with detail. Uh, with it restored as Torah, which it is. Again, you got to read our book, bookofjubilees.org. Go download it free, read it in ebook. We prove that out in the introduction before you even read the book. You'll see for yourself. What we do know is, is you will not disprove those findings. So no one could ever actually attempt something like the Serpent Sea Doctrine uh, with Jubilees in the picture. It obliterates it. Here you go. So many doctrines are birthed from censoring this book of Jubilees. Jubilees 4, verse 1. And in the third week, in the second Jubilee, Jubilees 49 years, uh, and a week would be week of years, so sevens of years, so 21 years, essentially, uh, within the second Jubilee. So that's, that's how the, the date comes out there, uh, 64 to 70 a.m., uh, Anumundi, which means from creation, basically. She gave birth to Cain. So Eve gave birth to Cain. Uh, no one else birthed Cain, right? And who was the father? Well, Adam was. That is very clear, again, both in Jubilees and Genesis and First Enoch, for that matter. And in the fourth uh, week, or seven years apart, in instance, because Cain was born in the third, right? And now she gave birth to Abel, about seven years apart, so no, they were not twins, not even remotely. Again, Eve was not pregnant for uh, Cain, and then held in Abel for seven years until she had the twin. That wouldn't be defined as twins anyway, not really, and again, not even close. And in the fifth, uh, that's week or years, uh, that is seven, so another seven years after that, she gave birth to her daughter, the first daughter since creation, 
Awan. Wow, and what a name. As in Pala Awan. Palawan. Hmm. Extraordinary in Hebrew, Pala. Awan, first daughter. Or the name also means beautiful to look at, uh, which Palawan fits exactly. Amazing how that Hebrew name and connotation seems to survive in that area. Odd. That's who Cain will marry, in fact, not some alternative creation, which never existed in the whole of Scripture. You won't find it. Uh, they make up doctrines of men like that, but they never vet with Scripture. And again, when you bring Jubilees in, this nails it down. Done. You, you know exactly when Cain was born, exactly when Abel was born, and you know who Cain married because you know when his wife was born, and it says later that he married her, so pretty easy. This has never been complex, ever. It has never required someone who has a degree in anything to be able to read and understand. The problem is we don't have Jubilees. Jubilees is the book of divisions, times, uh, you know, the calendar, etc. And when you throw that out, well, that's the foundation. So you, you basically are throwing out part of the foundation of Torah, and you have Genesis standing alone with no witness at all, which is against Scripture and really illiterate of any scholar, to suggest that that book is supposed to stand on its own, having never tested Jubilees, either single one of them. And we've proven that. They just say, oh, don't read that, it's scary. Is it? Uh, is it really scary that it says Cain was born, then Abel was born, and then Awan was born? And answers the question, were they twins? Answers the question, who did Cain marry? Answers the question, when exactly were they born? And was this uh, serpent seed? You know, all of this stuff crushed right here in one verse. All these strange new doctrines that we find in many churches today. So when were children born to Noah's sons? Let's go to after the flood. Well, they had no sons before the flood. None, no, nope, not one. Go and look up all the different verses that make it very clear that only eight entered the ark. That's Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. That's it. That's eight. That's it total. No babies, and no babies were born on the ark, period, because the only eight left the ark, humans, that is. So there's no way to justify, especially that lousy movie we mention every now and then, uh, by the Hollywood Gnostic Kabbalist, uh, even you know endorsed by the likes of Focus on the Family, who is so ignorant that they can't even understand they're watching a Gnostic account, not a biblical one, literally a satanic account, and they don't even know it. And that's where the state of the church is today, and it's very sad. Let's see. First, let's go to Genesis 10, 1, uh, which begins with, now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. If you ever hear anybody say that Noah had other sons, they're lying to you. He didn't, okay? So that's just a fact. Now, he did have daughters, and we've covered that in the mysterious birth of Noah. Watch it. Uh, we've covered their bloodlines in uh, Wives of the Patriarchs, which we get even the wives' uh, bloodlines directly from Seth, no Nephilim, and no Cain in any of them, not a single one. Now then it says, and unto them were sons born after the, the flood. Okay, so the sons were born when? Well, not before the flood. Does it say that? No. Does it say during the flood? No, it says they were born after the the flood. Okay, so Genesis has always said that, but it doesn't give all detail. And Genesis doesn't on many things. So what we need to do is we need to go to the book of Jubilees to find out the detail. Now, they had no sons till after the flood period. The Noah movie, of course, is ridiculous. Uh, they try to claim that, uh, you know, one of the wives uh, had a son and Noah, the psychopath, because that's what they make him and Yahuwah out to be, just had to kill him. He wanted to kill him because, uh, you know, how dare he be born? He knew that, that he would be evil or whatever, you know, they make up. It doesn't really matter what they make up because it's a clear lie. There were no babies born on the ark. The whole story is a lie. In fact, the whole movie is a lie, really. There's 
elements of truth within, uh, but it's really lousy. Um, but why doesn't Genesis tell us who was first here? Well, it just doesn't. I mean, it goes on to start the lineages of Japheth, in fact, and he's not the oldest. Uh, he's the youngest, so not the first to have children either. So why? Well, it just does. I mean, every time Genesis talks about the three sons of Noah, it's not always, uh, you know, saying this is the order of when they were born. Do you do things that way? I mean, it, it just is a ridiculous way for scholars to look at the Bible, especially when several times uh, the Bible says Shem. It lists Shem first. So you would look at that then and really say Shem was first. However, you don't need to because Jubilees tells you. See, Genesis 10 is not in order here in this regard, uh, and it is not to be read as such. There's just no need for it because we have this very solidly proven uh, in Jubilees with, a, with another source, in fact. You'll find that Jubilees, Enoch, and Genesis all agree that Shem is the oldest, with Ham second and Japheth the third. But who had the first child after the flood? That's what we're getting to. Jubilees tells us who and when because it is the historic book of times, divisions, genealogies. It firmly is. Now, some will even attempt to argue because a comma was misplaced or really not there uh, and should be uh, when it says in verse 21, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth. No, Eber wasn't the brother of Japheth. You could misread it that way, but it'd be pretty dumb. But, you know, it, but this is the problem. This is what happens here. The brother of Japheth should be comma, the elder. See, see, that doesn't make sense because Japheth is not the elder. Shem is the elder. And the sentence is about Shem, he's the subject. He's the brother of Japheth. Japheth's not the elder. Shem is. See, again, just a comma throws off the interpretation of the Bible. That's how easy it is for uh, the Pharisees, especially, to manipulate it, and they have, or exploit something that could have been an easy mistake. Um, Shem is the oldest, period, and you'll see. Even to him were children born, it says uh, at the end of that in verse 21. Now, showing that Shem is the subject here, not Japheth. It's so odd how scholars forget the sentence structure and then err so poorly on things like this. But see, you can't do it when you restore Jubilees, which clarifies this and answers the question. I mean, with Jubilees, we don't have to go through all of these gymnastics. It's easy. It's written right there very plainly. And why would Genesis have to repeat all the details in Jubilees? Well, that wouldn't make sense. Uh, it's a different book. It doesn't just as Jubilees is not written so that every word matches Genesis. Or, well, then would it not just be called Genesis? Yet, scholars will try to use that in reasoning to box Jubilees into a false paradigm that if it doesn't have every word of Genesis and doesn't add anything or take away anything, uh, that's stupid because it is Torah. Torah can't add or take away from Torah. So that, first of all, is ridiculous. But yes, they attempt that both ways to undermine Jubilees, yet they only prove foolish. And again, we have people that come into this channel almost every day trying to fight, even just yesterday, they're trying to fight. Oh, yeah, you used Jubilees. How dare you? Uh, how dare you not do your research? And how dare you be so uneducated sitting there and basically defending a Pharisee Bible? You think your Pharisee Bible is the Bible? Ah, uh, wow. You know, it's time for us all to learn, and many, of course, are on this channel. Now, here's a quick one. Peter tells us eight souls, eight people were saved on the ark. Not nine, not 8.5, uh, eight people, period. Scripture is clear. And that is Noah and his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. Now, there's six plus two is eight. Can't get any children before the flood, no children, 
during, didn't happen, eight people were saved on the ark. Basically, we're just filling in some gaps here, and this is where we really get down to it. Uh, Jubilees fills them in, and this is why we need Jubilees. Again, after testing it first, but we did that. We published it in a full book, available free in ebook, bookofjubilees.org. Uh, and uh, we vet it in the introduction very well with a very comprehensive Torah test, uh, including historicity, uh, including historicity of the community where it was kept. You have to watch, you have to read that or uh, even watch the series Answers in Jubilees, and you'll see that we do that. Try to argue, oh, Jubilees isn't Torah. I mean, yeah, right. Without watching it, without reviewing our position, you've broken our rules. Sorry. Uh, our channel, our rules. No debate in ignorance. We put forth positions and we prove them out because we want you to know. There you go. Jubilee 718. And these are the sons of Shem, Elam and Asher, and our Foxad. Now notice Elam is first there. Hmm. Okay, but wait. This son, our Foxad, this son was born two years after the flood. And Lud and Aram. Now, it's a match to Genesis in order, by the way, but it gives more detail. Again, what do scholars do? They look at it and say, oh, well, it's in that order, therefore... Elam must be the firstborn, right? Now, we did that too, to be quite blunt. Uh, we've said that, I believe, in our Jubilees uh, mapping. Uh, and, you know, now, as we read this and start to understand, it couldn't be the case. Uh, Elam and Asher would have had to have been born uh, two years before. So, our foxhead was born two years after the flood. Okay, you got to give... Nine months, because that's still the term for a child, for uh, from conception to birth, uh, you know. And basically, you you in the first year after the flood, um, you know, uh, our fox had was conceived by Shem and his wife. So, pretty clear, that's the first child after the flood. Now, because none other are listed as such, none other are dated. There's nothing there, and this is this is the purpose of jubilees, is to put things down in a timeline of sort. That's why it's called jubilees. It's the book of times. It's the book of divisions. That's another name for it. Book of division. Uh, Noah's division of the earth, especially his three sons, focuses very heavily on that time period. Now, contrary to many opinions, jubilees really squashes them all because they're just opinions they're just guesses jubilees isn't guessing here it's telling you exactly the case uh it tells us our fox has actually the oldest son of shem regardless of the order in which they are listed which is the same that we see throughout every time you see a listing it does not reorder the sons they have one order very specifically now we're going to see that as well again jubilees very clear on that, but also its second witness will be too. So, it took two years after the flood till the first child was born, as it was the son of Shem. Eber and his sons, Peleg and Joktan, Joktan, will all descend from this first son, our Foxad. Isn't that cool? Now again, it is assumed that Elam is the oldest, uh, but you can't assume that the Bible is always putting things in the order of oldest to youngest every time it lists things. In this particular instance, if you go and you look at Jubilees, Jubilees also, uh, the division of the earth, uh, where Shem divides part of his territory, he divides first, in the same order, uh, to Elam. Not because it's his oldest son, but that's the order of things. Uh, why? Well, because that's maybe who he saw first. You don't know. It, it doesn't matter. The point is it's a false litmus test to say every time there is a listing of characters in the Bible, that must be oldest to youngest. There are other reasons for uh, Moses to list them that certain way, or really the angel of the presence who's the origin. So there you go. Two years after the flood, first child was born. There you go. 
So again, it is um, not an accurate test to apply, uh, you know, the, the scholarly thinking of every time you see an order, it, it just has to be the order of uh, when the sons were born, when that's absolute nonsense. Genesis 10 especially uh, starts with Japheth. Well, he's the youngest. Well, wait. No, he's the oldest now. Well, why is he the oldest now? Who changed it to Japheth being the oldest? No one but stupid scholars who do that and play these ridiculous games that can't even seem to read. So, who cares why? I mean, that, that's always the question. Why was Japheth listed first? Who really cares why? But, you know, Moses didn't tell us exactly why. But, hey, you want to why? Here you go. This is called logic. Maybe... He was listing them geographically, as Japheth was given the territories in the north. Shem, Asia, and Ham, going further south, the southern hemisphere. A far better assumption than the traditionally and likely the reason, uh, but we are not given the reason why he listed them in this order. So why scholars spend so much ink on this kind of thing when they just babble along and don't have any support for anything because the record is in jubilees, which they ignore. The giant leaps representing a true paradigm really of no value. Uh, <laughs> they even go on and on trying to attack confusion in translations, yet they are the ones that are confusing them. It's their fault. They censor part of Torah. That's a problem. That's a massive problem problem that comes with a curse. Jubilees clarifies this whole thing. But wait a minute, you mean, even historically, you would think they would look at it at least that way for geography, for uh, genealogy. These things would be simple. I mean, Josephus did it. He quotes Jubilees several times. He never ever gives Jubilees credit, but that's where he's getting it from because he's not getting it from Genesis and he'll get things like this right. So, but wait a minute, didn't we say like this, uh, you know, something like this sh should, should have a second witness? Yes, we did. And guess what? It does. No, it's not in Genesis. It is in the Qumran scrolls, however, though in Genesis Apocryphon. Check this out. This is cool. Now, this is Noah writing uh, to first son Shem. He just confirmed also that Shem is his oldest son yet again. Exactly what Jubilees and really Genesis has always said. Really doesn't say any different. Again, that's just scholars playing around with the order, something they have no right to do whatsoever. Understand Genesis does in fact list Shem first uh, in 523, 610, 713, and then 1 Chronicles 1 4 does as well. So, yes, Torah says exactly this if, if you want to go along with what scholars use as logic. There's no confusion really yet. They hop back and forth because, well, Genesis 10 doesn't order them the same way. Well, because Genesis 10 doesn't use when they were born as the order, as the premise, which is very obvious if you have foundation set on Scripture, on Torah, which you need Jubilees to have. What they have is a conflict that they created themselves in a false paradigm. That's what scholars are doing. Shem is not the oldest son because, well, he's listed first here or there. That's, that's, not, that's not thinking. That's not logic that can really be applied. Again, you know this when you read it in Jubilees, and it's very direct, and now here in Genesis Park from. He's first because Jubilees says he was directly, and here we go, affirmed. Boom. But with the second and third witness of Genesis, this is very clear, see? Uh, even on this particular point. To Shem was born to begin with. Now that's the first son after the flood and first period of Noah's three sons. To begin with is very clear 
language. Okay. A son, R. Foxat. And further confirming the timeline as the second witness of Jubilees in this instance, two years after the flood. There you go. R. Foxad is the first son born after the flood, just two years after. So before the flood, Cain was the firstborn son of Adam and Eve. Actually, over 50 years after the Garden Exile, and no, Eve was uh, not pregnant for over 50 years. That's, of course, nonsense. Thus, she did not conceive in the garden. There goes the serpent seed doctrine. Done, gone, nonsense. Again, with the second and third witness of Genesis, you just can't use these strange doctrines. They can't be applied in any sense. They fail very quickly, even with the read of Genesis, especially that doctrine. Uh, but then they'll go into the Hebrew and say, well, this Hebrew word could mean, you know, the 43rd definition of 80. Uh, it could mean uh, seduced. Uh, and seduced could be sexual, except for the definition right there in the concordances says not in a sexual nature. Duh. I mean, they can't even read the Hebrew. But regardless, they'll do that and they'll try to go what appears to be deeper. They're not going deeper. Uh, that's certainly not deeper. Deeper would be going into Jubilees, would be going into First Enoch, Genesis Apocryphon, and let's see if this is confirmed or not. Very clearly, the serpent seed is trash. Now, thus, no conception in the garden. In fact, no sex in the garden. Doesn't happen, didn't happen, and we know this because we know on Mount Sinai, now Moses first instructed the men, do not go into your wives for three days prior to the presence of Yahuwah coming. And the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies, and you better believe Adam and Eve had no relations while in the garden, period. Didn't happen. Then Abel, about seven years later, and the first daughter, Awan, about seven years after that and she married Cain, not some alternative creation. And you'll hear all the time the question, Well, who did Cain marry? Well, Cain married his sister. Ew, he married his sister. You mean the perfect genetic, <laughs> uh, Awan first daughter ever birthed? Who else did he marry? Duh, no one. There's no one else available. So they can try to ridicule all they want, they got nothing. So ridiculed him back. That has never actually been a question, except from the limited scholars who censor part of Torah. And yes, that does come from scholars. Yes, there are actual scholars, especially rabbis, that propagate this absolute nonsense. Now, how about, how about not? How about we not censor part of Torah? How about that? This is pretty simple to understand. Genesis itself has never left room for that doctrine of pre-Adamic man the doctrine of serpent seed, the gap theory, all of these things fail miserably. And we're going to go into more detail in some of these uh, in our creation series, which is where it belongs. Then, after the flood, uh, not during and not before, uh, there were only eight on the ark. That's what Peter tells you. Only eight well, well, were on the ark and only eight survived. See, Peter's very specific there. Only eight were saved. There you go. So you can't add a ninth. You can't say there's a son born on the ark. And again, that movie that tries to play that Gnostic script out uh, is illiterate. No children of the three sons, period. Not before the flood, not during the flood in the ark, and not even after the flood until two years. There's a reason why Jubilees and Genesis Apocryphon spell this out that our fox had was the first born after the flood, the son of Shem. Now, he's the one who Peleg and Joktan, Joktan, then descended from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, as well as Ophir, Sheba, and Havilah, all bros, I think there's 13 sons of Joktan, uh, all Hebrews. Not Israelite Hebrews, but Hebrews nonetheless. Even Josephus 
clarifies that a Hebrew means they're from Eber. Same word if you look at them. We cover that uh, in multiple videos, especially Solomon's Gold series. Only those who Jacob, Jacob, not even Abraham nor Isaac, are Hebrew Israelites. Only those from him. No one else. Okay. There are no Hebrews, in fact, before Eber. There's no such thing. You can't even you, know, you can't even use the word Hebrew prior. Um, so yes, patriarchs were not Hebrew. Oh no! What do you mean they weren't Hebrew? Adam was not a Hebrew. Duh. I mean, a, you know, because you, you can't get there until Eber. So understand that. Now, what are we doing? We're trying to clear up some things here in the Flood series uh, as we're about to start our creation series very soon. And uh, we hope this serves to clear up this topic once and for all. We're also going to be publishing a book on this, and uh, it's a work in progress. We'll get there, but hey, look out for it coming soon.